sector, but their individual families and their tragic stories, and they're playing out at an increasing number across our economy. We know that we're in a per capita uh, GDP recession at the moment uh, for uh, individuals who are really doing it hard. And I don't believe that the government has the answers. And I don't believe that Australians can afford three more years of this Labor government. Uh, every decision they make is making it harder, not easier for families and small businesses. Um, so very pleased to be here today. And in terms of energy costs, uh, as Melissa's pointed out, uh, electricity is up by 20 per cent. Gas is up by 27 per cent. And yet the Prime Minister promised on 100 occasions that your electricity bills would go down by $275. We've started this discussion about the latest technology, nuclear, because it's zero emissions. It can provide us with cleaner power, but affordable power and reliable power. There are manufacturers in our country at the moment who are shutting up operations and moving offshore. Why would we want that? Why does the government have an energy policy in place which is driving these businesses offshore? We lose the jobs. We lose the economic productivity. We lose the taxes and we import the products back into Australia because we don't stop consuming them and there is a higher net loss of emissions into the atmosphere. Uh, it just doesn't make sense, the path the government's got us on at the moment. It's why we need a clear pathway. It's why the Prime Minister should stand up and debate with me the issue of nuclear and energy in this country. I'll meet him at the press club or wherever he wants at any time we can have the debate and uh, we need it because at the moment there is so much uncertainty in the economy and businesses like this continue to have significant growth in their, not just their energy costs, but their input costs otherwise. And ultimately those costs have to be passed on to consumers, which is why people are paying more for every basket of groceries at the supermarket. It's why they're paying more when they go to fuel up their car. It's why they're paying more for their insurance and the government just doesn't have an answer for them. And uh, I want to work very closely with Melissa, particularly here in Western Sydney, uh, to make sure that we listen again to people who are living in this great part of the world. I'm very happy to take any questions. Well, we've, we've said uh, very clearly that they should be confined to areas uh, where we've got a coal-fired generator that's coming to an end of life uh, because of a couple of reasons. One is you've got a brownfield site. Secondly, you've got the ability to distribute the energy that's generated out of that site. The government's proposal to build 28,000 kilometres of poles and wires, the whole system that they're talking about costs up to about $1.3 trillion. Now, all of that money is going to be passed on in the form of higher electricity bills, and people are paying through the nose already for their electricity bill under this government, but they haven't seen anything yet. Prices are going to continue to go up, but worse than that, we're going to see blackouts and brownouts and disruption to supply. The government at the moment is saying to businesses, ramp down your activity in the afternoon if you're a high energy using business because we don't want blackouts and brownouts during that peak period when people are coming home from work to try and you know, cook their dinner or put a load of washing on. We can't have that in our country. We need a strong, reliable energy source. We need it at the cheapest possible price and we need it to be clean. And that's what our policy is designed and targeted at, and uh, we'll have more to say about the exact locations over the next couple of weeks. But we've been very clear that an adoption of a, of a newest technology uh, that has zero emissions is the only credible pathway we have to net zero by 2050. At the moment, let's not continue with the fantasy that Labor has that they can get to net zero by 2050. They just can't. Uh, in, in the vicinity of six. We'll, we'll provide you with that detail over the next couple of weeks. Um, Australia's former chief scientist, Alan Finkel, said last year it was highly unlikely Australia could open a nuclear power reactor before the early 2040s. Isn't that far too long? And wouldn't Australia be better off focusing on renewables? Well, we, we need to firm up renewables. So I'm completely and utterly in favour of renewables. I want to see renewables in our system, but you, you need to be able to firm them up. In a factory like this, there's no solar panels on the roof uh, because of the structure they just can't carry the weight. And for a business like this, they need to rely on a secure energy grid. If the power is intermittent, as it is with wind or solar, then the business here can't operate. You can't have a situation where uh, the machinery is closing down and then 
ramping back up an hour later. That, that, that's not how you can run a modern economy. And as we've seen already, many businesses are moving to the United States, for example, where they're paying a third the cost of electricity than what they're paying here because they're in a nuclear state. We know that in Ontario, for example, uh, families there are paying about half the cost of electricity because of nuclear in the system compared to what families in Western Sydney are paying. The government's 28,000 kilometres of new poles and wires is never going to be built. It's a fantasy. It's equal to the distance of our coastline. And they're talking about rolling that out. It's not going to happen. The cost is exponential and prohibitive. And I believe that we should follow the path of every other G20 nation who is either in their system at the moment relying on nuclear energy to firm up renewables or has committed to introducing nuclear. Uh, why is Australia any different? And Chris Bowen is out there running all sorts of scare campaigns, uh, but nobody should take any notice of that. Let's stick to the facts of the debate. We can have a modern system that is zero emissions uh, and can contribute to, uh, I think, a renewal of manufacturing in this country. More jobs, more industry, and that's what the Liberal Party is about. But isn't nuclear fantasy will take decades to build and coal-fired power plants to closing left, right and centre? But, but again, you can't go from coal-fired power to 100% renewables, which is the government's policy, because you need to firm up. So the latest battery that AGL has installed in Adelaide uh, at a cost of $180 million, the battery firms up for between one hour and two hours. We're not talking 200 hours, so if you're getting clement weather for a week, what, what happens in Labor's model where you can't have the lights on in this factory? What, what happens to the cold rooms at the IGA or at the local butcher shop or the local manufacturer of food? What, what, what happens in that model where the lights go out and the power bills continue to go up? Business won't operate. It can't. Uh, in our country, we've got a high labour cost, we've got a high compliance cost, we've got a high regulatory burden... And businesses just say, well, I'll move to Malaysia or I'll go to the United States where they're paying a third of the electricity costs that they are here. Uh, we've got to be realistic about our position in the world. I want to grow Australian jobs. I want to keep Australian industry. The Prime Minister's energy, energy policy is going to drive jobs offshore. It's going to reduce the amount of manufacturing that we do in our country. And going from coal to 100% renewable is just not realistic. No other country is doing that. But it's, it's, it's a discredited report. Let's be clear about it. It's not relied on. It's not a genuine piece of work. It doesn't take into account uh, some of the transmission costs, uh, the costs around subsidies for the renewables. Uh, and when you look at a like-for-like, like, uh, as 20 countries, ex except for... So 19 of the 20 G20 countries have done. Why does it stack up for those, for those economies but not for Australia? So I would look at... Uh, the independent, verifiable evidence. And that all points to us having a transition to a zero emissions, latest technology nuclear, where we can firm up renewables in the system. If we do that, we can have cleaner energy, we can have cheaper energy, and we can have reliable energy. The path that the Prime Minister's got us on at the moment is going to result in the lights going out, prices going up, and businesses moving offshore. I, th I think that's been well documented. Um, how would you convince communities to get on board? Well, again, you need community support and you need licence. And if you look at other markets, uh, they've done that. They've gone and worked with local communities. Uh, there are incentives that you can put in place to provide support. Well, you can put in place uh, discounts in relation to electricity prices, for example, which ends up attracting industry and creates jobs and generates a huge multiplier for the local economy. That's what's happened in many other markets, in comparable markets. Uh, you can provide support, as frankly should be happening in rural areas at the moment, where you've got wind turbines. In my area, uh, and I suspect in suburbs uh, close to where we're standing now, they don't want wind turbines. They don't want large-scale solar farms. Do they want nuclear? And we'll have that discussion. Uh, if there's a coal-fired generator in this site, um, I don't believe that there is, uh, then we'll have that discussion. But, of course, there is no coal fire generator in this community. But my point is that you need community licence. I don't want to continue down the path the Prime Minister's got us on at the moment, 
which is pitching one Australian against the other. Uh, I don't want a situation where people in regional areas are considered less as Australians than they are in the CBD. And at the moment, the Prime Minister's got an energy policy which is all about winning votes from the Greens in inner city Sydney and Melbourne. My party that I lead very proudly is about reducing energy prices, having clean energy, making sure that we have reliable energy, and that's the policy that we've got. Uh, the Prime Minister needs social licence when he goes out into communities to talk about the amenity impact, uh, the impact on farmers. At the moment, he's not doing that, which is why you know, up to 92% of people are concerned um, that there's not sufficient engagement in those communities. And to roll out 28,000 kilometres of poles and wires through national parks, across pristine farming land, requires the compulsory acquisition of land. Uh, that is going to be a process that will be years in the courts, hundreds of billions of dollars in expenditure, and frankly, it's a pipe dream. It's never going to happen. I, look, I, such childish discussions just don't belong in a modern debate, to be honest, and, and to be frank and, and, and honest with you. If you have a look at what, if you have a look at the latest generation nuclear technology, have a look at what it can, is capable of doing. This is like the, the prime minister saying, not even the prime minister is running the safety argument, right? Because I'll tell you why. He's just signed up for our sailors in Australian uniform to serve on a nuclear submarine that can sit at the bottom of the ocean with those reactors powering the submarine for months at a time. If the Prime Minister thought that the latest generation nuclear technology wasn't safe, why would he put our submariners onto nuclear-propelled submarines? Well, if he's, if, he's, uh, if he's acted outside of the rules, then... Uh, there's penalties in place for it. And if he's acted outside of the rules, the penalties should apply. If he's being a hypocrite about criticising people for hopping on planes and contributing to emissions, uh, then, you know, I, I think... I mean, ask me the general question, is Adam Bant a hypocrite? Uh, of course he is, of the first order. Uh, he's a hypocrite. He's half crazy, right? His whole energy policy would destroy the economy. He's economically illiterate. Uh, and the Greens have nothing to contribute to the way in which our economy should run. And yet the Labor Party rely on them. And the most likely outcome from the polls at the moment is a Labor Greens government at the next election, which would be devastating for families in Western Sydney. It would be devastating for small businesses and for me medium-sized businesses because the Greens policies destroy those jobs. Uh, and yet the Prime Minister is in lockstep uh, with the Greens political party uh, I want to lead a country where we can see Australian jobs grow. I don't want the Albanese model of exporting jobs. I want to lead a country where we can have clean energy and that we can have reliable energy and we can have lower cost energy. That's what we will implement. That is what we will deliver. And yet the Prime Minister will deliver a model that's going to have great uncertainty, huge cost. I, I just think we should remind ourselves of the pressure that families are under at the moment. There are people sitting around kitchen tables tonight in tears, wondering how they're going to pay their bills. And the only solution the Prime Minister has for them is to increase the price of their bills. And not only that, the price of their insurance, the price of their groceries. Because energy has an impact on every element of the supply chain. When people go to the supermarket and they buy, I don't know, strawberry jam, the strawberries are costing more in cold storage because of the energy costs. The fertiliser is costing more because it's energy intensive. Uh, the farmer is paying more to the workers because their bills at home have gone up. And ultimately, that jar of strawberry jam or the cereal or the meat or the groceries, the fruit and vegetables that you're buying, all of those prices are going up under this government because of their crazy energy policy. And we have a solution to lower prices, to make energy reliable and to make it cleaner and greener. And the juvenile comments from the Prime Minister and others uh, need to be put to one side. I will debate the Prime Minister on this issue anytime, anywhere. Yes, yes, yes. I've got two more minutes, right? On another topic, aged care, do you support the idea of wealthier Australians contributing more to the cost of aged and in-home care? Well, let, let's wait to see what the government has to say 
on aged care. Clearly, they've got an unsustainable system at the moment. Uh, we are very happy to have the discussion with the government, although, as Senator Rustin points out, they haven't been forthcoming in their discussions with us. So we'll see the detail, uh, because with an ageing population, we want to act responsibly, we'll support sensible reforms, but we don't know anything about what's happening with workforce and uh, if it's just a sop to the union movement uh, and they're making it even more unsustainable for providers to increase beds at a time when we need those increased beds, then uh, that's not something we would support. So we'll have a look at the detail and, uh, and provide our response then. Canada and Sweden have restored funding for UNRWA. Why shouldn't Australia follow suit and put you back to well, I, I want to see aid uh, get into Gaza, but I think the United States is the best option for the government to provide that aid now. There is no way in the world this government should be providing aid to an organisation that has been linked to a listed terrorist organisation, including listed in this country. So imagine if the proposition from Ed Husig was that our government should provide aid to al-Qaeda or to a listed terrorist organisation otherwise. Uh, I don't think anybody would accept that proposition. And the links are indisputable. Uh, the tragic circumstances that followed from Hamas's horrible attack on the Israeli people in uh, October uh, is uh, one of the, the most shameful acts in history. And if the government's proposing to give money to an organisation uh, that has definite links to a listed terrorist organisation, they should explain why that's the case. OK, sorry. Yes. I, I, I am absolutely thrilled and excited to have Melissa in her new role. A, because she understands Western Sydney. Uh, her family, like many other families across Western Sydney, under the same pressures. Uh, she has a professional background and expertise, a great communicator that's meant that she's not only a wonderful local member but also a very significant contributor to our shadow ministry discussions. Uh, a very valuable contributor. Uh, she's an astute person. Uh, she has a good read on and a good connection with uh, what people are thinking. And that's why she's an integral part to our success. Uh, not only do I back her uh, in the pre-selection, but I would say to all people in what's a democratic process, uh, I would urge them strongly to back and to vote for Melissa. Um, in our party, pre-selections can be contested anywhere. That's a, a democratic right. Um, but there is not an outcome that I will accept where Melissa is not the candidate at the next election. I want to be very clear about that. Uh, she's a great candidate. She's an integral part of our team, uh, and she will be the candidate for us at the time of the next election. And I'll just, to all those who are listening and need to listen, I'll send that very clear message. All right, thank you very much.